Hello, everyone, and welcome to Washington National Cathedral. Um, we're so pleased that you could join us today. Um, and whether and we are very pleased to welcome back those of you who have visited with us before. Uh, for those of you who are joining us for the first time, welcome to this extraordinary building in the nation's capital. Uh, this 14th century English Gothic style cathedral was begun in 1907 and completed in 1990. Built of tons and tons of Indiana limestone, the cathedral was built in, in a true Gothic manner, stone on stone construction with no structural steel in the walls, columns or vaulting. The cathedral was entirely constructed and still primarily funded by gifts and donations and receives no money from taxes or the National Episcopal Church. Its goal and mission is to serve the city of Washington DC, the surrounding region, the nation and the world. Most importantly, it's a house of prayer for all people where everyone is always welcome. And you are especially welcome today. So first of all, let me say Merry Christmas. Now, this might seem a strange thing to say to you on the 29th of December. Uh, for a lot of us, Christmas is focused on Christmas Eve and on Christmas Day. But here at the cathedral, we celebrate the season of Christmas. And let me try and explain a little bit about what that may mean. For many people, Christmas is over. We've been to church to hear the great story of Jesus's birth. We've opened our presents and spent time with friends and family, eaten and drunk festive foods and drinks of the season and admired Christmas cards and decorations. And that's certainly true here at the cathedral. These images are from Christmas at the cathedral in 2019 with our family pageant on the left and our full house of worshipers on Christmas Eve. And these are only some of the many things that occur here at Christmas at the cathedral. Another one is very close to my heart, as Mimi has mentioned. Uh, my husband and I curate uh, a collection, a, an, exhi an exhibition of crushes from around the world, a small selection of the over 700 crushes that the cathedral owns. They each nativity set tells the familiar story of the birth of Christ in new ways through the traditions and countries around the world. But this year is different, certainly has been different. Um, we have had uh, changes in our lives and changes in our, in our Christmas. And the cathedral's Christmas certainly has looked different. But today, we still celebrated the birth of Christ with joy and with reverence. But for many people now, Christmas is over and done and we're thinking about the new year. But what if you wanted to extend this time of joy and celebration a bit longer? The church gives us an opportunity to continue to celebrate and meditate on the Christmas season. In the early days of the church, they wanted the celebration of this world changing event and for us to meditate on its importance in our lives in these days after we've received the gift of the Christ child. Not every denomination or branch of the Christian church celebrates the season of Christmas, and some celebrate for a longer or shorter period of time. Some focus only on Christmas Eve and Christmas Day, and for many, Christmas, for many Christians around the world, Christmas hasn't even occurred yet. But because the cathedral is an Episcopal cathedral, a denomination that has its roots in the English or Anglican church, we celebrate what is now called the season of Christmas, or Christmas Tide, which is perhaps better known as the 12 days of Christmas from the famous carol. This season begins on Christmas Day and lasts until the evening of January the, January the 5th. For many Western Christians, this is the season of celebration, of carols and fellowship. As heard in the carol, this is a season of abundance, maids milking and geese laying and so many different kinds of birds, and a season of celebration all those lords leaping and ladies dancing and drummers drumming. This is the time for rejoicing in God's great gift and for beginning to ponder the mysteries of God coming to earth in human form. This season invites us to think about what it means to have just received Emmanuel, 
God with us and what our response to that gift might be. And there's no better place to explore that than here at the cathedral. The cathedral's various images of the Christmas story help us to do just that. And they all have a slightly different perspective on that great story of Jesus's birth. This window, you see Mary and the Christ child. It's found downstairs in Bethlehem Chapel. And this is what's called a sonk foil, a five lobed piece of glass that sits often at the top of a window. This one sits at the top of a window that talks about the genealogy, the family tree of Christ. And even though this is basically a nativity scene, the focus of this image is really on the kingship of Christ. Because you can see Mary handing the child an orb, and an orb is a symbol of dominion, of rule. And in this case, it is the symbol of Christ having dominion over the world, while the child himself raises his hand to bless us as we view him. This window is found downstairs in the cathedral in Bethlehem Chapel. And for those of you who have not had a chance to visit us, the cathedral has two levels. One, the main nave level, which is our upstairs, and then downstairs is our crypt. Uh, this, the crypt level contains three chapels. They tell the story of Christ's birth, death, and resurrection. And this is our Christmas chapel. This is Bethlehem Chapel. It's the oldest chapel here at Washington National Cathedral. It was completed in 1912 and was the first interior area that was enclosed and able to be used for worship inside the cathedral. As you see, you're looking directly at the altar and the altar screen or reredos in this chapel. And you can see that there are windows directly behind it. We're gonna talk about those in just a few moments. This is a closer view as you walk down the aisle towards the altar here in Bethlehem Chapel. Now, all the images in Bethlehem Chapel depict the entire arc of the Christmas story. Uh, they start, but perhaps surprisingly, very few images in this chapel actually depict the stories of Christmas itself. Most of these images in the chapel come from ancient prophecies about the coming Messiah, which are usually read during the previous season of Advent. And there are also images that talk about the season that comes immediately after Christmas, which is called Epiphany and is marked by the arrival of the wise men to the stable in Bethlehem on January 6th. This is the Reredos or altar screen as it would be decorated for the Christmas season, but in Advent, it would have no decorations on it at all. Now we talked briefly about the, about the windows in this chapel. There's a, they are a set of five. They are set in an arc around the back of the chapel in a walkway that's called an ambulatory. And these windows tell the entire Christmas story from the genealogy of Christ through to his presentation in the temple as a young child. The one window in this chapel that relates directly to the events of Christmas is called the glory in excelsis window, which means glory to God in the highest. And it shows the angel's appearance to those certain poor shepherds in fields as they lay. These, all these windows were designed by John Lyle for the firm of Kemp and Company based in London, England. They were shipped across the Atlantic and installed in the chapel in 1912. They're very characteristic of Kemp and Company windows and of English windows in general with their fine painted detail and what are called matted backgrounds. These matted or filmed backgrounds are created by fusing soft washes of pigment, ground glass, and a fixative to the individual pieces of glass before they are assembled into the window. And they are, this, these washes are painted on and then the glass is kilned. And so all of these mats and films and details become permanently bonded to the glass itself. The process was meant to imitate the weathering scene on medieval windows, um, which people still feel are the high point of the stained glass art all across the world. Um, it also means that the light does not pass through these windows, but is rather held in the windows. These windows don't sparkle, they glow. And on the left-hand side, you can see two of, two of the angels 
in a quatrefoil, a four-lobed uh, piece of glass, and you can see that they are painted with amazing details. The red background looks like brocade fabric, but that the light, the colored light, is held within the glass. It does not splash out onto the carvings or other areas of the chapel. Let's look at this window a little bit more closely. So you, the glowing effect is, is really seen in this very regal angel that appears to the astonished shepherds in this window. Um, he or she uh, is dressed as if they were royal. They wear a diadem or crown. They hold a staff of authority. Um, we should say that we'll probably be using he, she, or them to describe angels. Angels are messengers of God. They are not human beings, and so they do not have gender. Uh, we depict them as human because we have no way of knowing exactly what angels look like. Uh, here you can see the on the left-hand side, you get a sense of how strong and proud this angel is and the amazing rays of golden light that emanate from its body. Its hand is raised in blessing. And as you look at the face, you can make out all those incredibly painted details. You might notice that that the angel is actually dressed in ecclesiastical garments. The crossed uh, scarf across its, its body is really an ecclesiastical stole. And if you look at the, at the wings of the angel in the upper left-hand side, you might see a very characteristic piece of work from the Kempen Company. Their trademark is peacock wings in the wings of angels. And this is very appropriate because peacock feathers are often used as a symbol of, of the all seeing eye of God, the omnipotence and omniscience of God. And so as a messenger of God, quite appropriate that the angel has peacock feathers in its wings. Now here are the shepherds reacting to a rather sudden appearance of an angel that they could not imagine before it arrived. Uh, the shepherds are dressed as medieval European peasants. Um, they are dressed in layers and layers of warm clothes. They hold uh, their shepherd's staff. Uh, one has a sword, one has a pouch on a, across its, its, uh, its chest on the right, uh, there's a shepherd that has a bagpipe, often an attribute or an, a characteristic of depictions of shepherds. Um, often that is decided by the fact that these, these shepherds have been sitting out in a field. Uh, shepherding, we understand, has to do with spending long hours quietly and then dealing with emergencies as they arrive. And so these gentlemen would have needed something to pass the time. And a bagpipe would have been a very good instrument. Uh, I have a friend who is a piper that says that a solo bagpipe can be heard 10 miles away. And so this would have been a way for shepherds to have been able to feel like they were in contact with other shepherds while they are in the fields. Uh, as you can see, the angels are Oh, the shepherds are overwhelmed by the angel's appearance. Uh, this is, gentleman is astonished. Um, the Bible says that they were sore afraid or sorely afraid, um, or and modern tra translations tend to describe them as terrified. Um, this shepherd is astonished, I think. I don't, I don't know that he is absolutely terrified, but he certainly has thrown up his hand uh, in wonder and his eyes are very, very wide. Here again, you can see the beautiful washes in the, in the uh, scarf around the shepherd's shoulders and the incredible painted detail in the, in the fasteners that keep this shawl upon his body. Um, these are beautiful windows. You may also see that in the background, um, this is not the arid holy land. We are in a Western European forest. It is very green behind the shepherds. Now, the shepherds are not only astonished by the arrival of the first angel, but now they are probably completely overwhelmed by the appearance of what the Bible describes as the multitude of the heavenly hosts. So not only the first angel, but now so many more angels. Uh, again, you see the peacock feathers in their wings. Uh, they hold a banner which says, glory to God in the highest and on earth peace. 
In many depictions of the nativity, and possibly especially in nativity sets, angels often hold banners with the word Gloria on them. And people have often wondered why. There's been a lot of research and no firm determination, uh, but it seems that it underlies the importance of the announcement that Christ has been born. There's also an element whereby we don't understand how the angels communicated with the shepherds, and yet the shepherds seem to completely understand what they were being told. And perhaps this is a way of underlining that the shepherds understood and heard exactly the, the things that the angels wanted them to hear. Now, the text of the Gloria has been set by musicians for countless centuries. It's included in the service music used in many churches. If you've ever heard a performance of the Gloria, you've heard the song sung by the angels on Christmas Eve. If you've ever said or sung or chanted it, you have actually spoken angelic words. Now, one of the best things about giving tours in this format is the ability to get you so close to details that you would have trouble seeing if you were standing in the cathedral, especially the rays of light below the angels and their faces and the details of their costumes. The challenge in giving tours in this format is trying to give you a sense of the size and scale of the building. And that's what the image on the left is trying, is trying to do for you. Um, it shows the size of the stained glass window on the right. <laughs> uh, to give you a sense of, of the proportion, can you see the little workman who is, who our little workman here who is standing in uh, what is called tracery, the carved stone frame into which stained glass is placed. These are very high above the, above the cathedral floor, and these are on the east end of the cathedral. Um, 50 years after, Beth after the window you just saw in Bethlehem Chapel, uh, artists Rowan and Irene LeCamp inter interpreted the same scene in a very different way. Uh, the angels of the nativity window is upstairs in this great choir clear story and what we call the angel choir. And this is an area that contains windows that depict angels from the Hebrew and Christian scriptures. Um, this level of, nave, of windows on the nave sits high in the walls and so often its images are elongated to appear in proportion. Like Bethlehem Chapel, this window moves into Epiphany. On the right, is the, a depiction of the flight into Egypt, and on the left, a depiction of the baptism of Jesus. But the center lancet of the window tells the same story we've just seen in a dramatically different way. So here is this glowing angel surrounded with, glow, with golden feather wings. He has bright blue spiked hair, which glows against his or her red halo. Uh, he is a very dramatic figure, and there's a more of a sense of movement to this figure than to the angel in the windows downstairs. As we get closer, you, can, you might notice some interesting things about this angel. Uh, for example, he has completely black eyes. He does not have a pupil or an iris like a human eye. And so this window again is telling you that these angels are not human. They are creatures of God. Um, his, he again wears something that looks very much like ecclesiastical garment. This, figure here is a long stole that goes all the way down the angel's body. And on that stole are stylized images of flowers and of crosses, which talks about the new life of Christ and also Christ's eventual death and sacrifice to redeem the world. Um, the, shepherd, the angel's hand, left hand gestures down to the earth towards an image of the rejoicing 
shepherds and they reach joyfully up towards the angel. Now, these are not the same shepherds that you just saw downstairs. Uh, these are a little bit more stylized. Um, we, like we like that this one is wearing what appears to be a very decorative ruff around his neck. Uh, notice that we have traded a bagpipe for pipes of pan. Um, also, again, we must have to uh, keep ourselves occupied as we are watching our flocks by night. Uh, also notice that two of these shepherds are in blue and two are the same gold as the angel. Um, and we want, and one of the interpretations put on that is that this shows the ardor of the shepherds, that they have heard the angel's message and they are filled with the desire to go to Bethlehem and see this child. And so they glow with ardor and with, with divinity and with joy. Now, the other hand of the angel reaches upward and points to a nativity scene. Here, Mary is seated on a chair. Uh, she leans back and lifts the child towards Joseph for him to see. Mary and Joseph both have painted faces, but the child does not. He's just a radiant being here. Uh, Joseph leans towards the child. His one hand is extended in welcome and his other reaches up towards his face and his heart in wonder and adoration. And these figures also glow with that same golden light that illuminates the angel. In this window, the angel serves as a bridge that depicts the new relationship between God and humanity through Christ's birth. Now, the Bethlehem Chapel window is on the left. The window up here in the great choir is on the right. And we're, and we're going to look at the angels in both of these windows. Uh, on the left, the Bethlehem Chapel window is the calm center of the window. Everyone reacts to this angel's presence. On the window on the right, this is an angel that is active. It moves the story forward. But what's amazing is the similarities between these two windows. Um, the postures are extremely similar um, and they both have that golden glow which surrounds them that shows that they are heavenly beings. Um, they try to depict the messengers of God and the joy of their message in human terms. But what's truly amazing about this is these windows were made only 50 years apart. The one on the left in 1912 and the one on the right in 1962. And so you see that you have gone from white glass with a lot of filming, an amazing sense of sort of interior radiance to the angel on the right, which sends its colors through the window and sends it out onto the carved stones around it. But the angels are the angels have come, they've told the shepherds this great story, and the shepherds have started to make the journey to Bethlehem. So what did they find when they got here? The earliest depiction of a nativity is the carving at the center of the Bethlehem Chapel altar screen, or Raridos. Although Technically, it probably isn't a nativity scene. It's probably, at least art historically, more properly called an adoration of the angels. It contains Mary and the Christ child, the ox and ass, six angels, and four tiny puti or cherub heads. It was designed by our, our, one of our earliest architects, Henry Vaughn sculpted by John Evans and carved in limestone by a gentleman whose last name I only know. His last name is Mr. Pernucci and it was carved in 1912 and also carved of limestone just like the building is made of. As we zoom in to, uh, to look at this even more closely, um, Mary holds the child 
on her lap. And it's unusual that his gaze is a little bit more turned toward her. In many depictions of, of the nativity, the child looks quite out directly at the viewer and at the world he has come to save. The child actually makes eye contact with us as a viewer. Uh, but this child is nestled quite close to Mary. She looks down at him. Uh, one of my favorite details in this carving is Mary's interlaced fingers that help to support the, the child as she holds him in, his lap, in her lap. Um, this just feels uh, very tenderly and motherly. If you've ever held a squirming child on your lap, you know that this is a very good way uh, to keep them securely where you want them to be. Of the kneeling angels on the left-hand side, the one closest to the Christ child is so anxious to see this blessed child that it has reached out its hand and it has taken the edge of Mary's veil and pulled it aside so the angels can have a better view of the Christ child. The angels on the left, there are six of them, three kneeling and three standing, are very, um, are very Renaissance in style. This carving is about, is really sort of 15th century Florentine style. And so it is a little bit more naturalistic. It is a little uh, less stiff, a little more free and elegant. Uh, you can see that they have beautifully draped um, clothing and that their wings are not peacock feathers, but indeed are bird feathers, perhaps raptor feathers, which talks about how quickly the angels can move. Above them are what are called puti. Puti are little angel heads. Uh, they are derived from classical cherubs. They are not cherubim, which is a whole different order of angels. Uh, they are little disembodied heads. Uh, puti means boys. Uh, puto, the single singular means boy. And these are very, these are very, very common in Renaissance painting. Uh, they are disembodied. Again, they aren't human. Uh, so very often they are depicted as additional angels, these little baby heads with tiny wings. And this one is in an amazing sinuous cloud, which supports them as they come to view and worship the Christ child. Now behind Mary and the child is a stable with an ox and ass, and that's a feature common to many nativity scenes. But why is it a, a, a feature common to many nativity scenes? As in many religious images, there are layers of symbolism that are embedded in this, in this image. First, these would have been common stable animals at the time of Christ. But why these two and not sheep or doves or, or any other of the other very common biblical animals? The reason they're here is, comes from a prophecy about the Messiah in the book of Isaiah, which says the ox knows his owner and the ass his master's crib. And so anyone who would have seen these animals would have known that they are sending the message that they are acknowledging Christ as the Messiah. On another symbolic level, the ox is an animal of sacrifice and the donkey is a symbol of humility. Both of these attributes are associated with the Messiah who humbly gave his life to redeem the world. Now in the cathedral, the image that most people would immediately say is the most traditional depiction of the nativity turns out not to belong to the Christmas season at all. This is a detail from it on the left. This is Mary and the Christ child. Um, if you have a good memory or you collect stamps, you might recognize this image. It was chosen by the United States Postal Service as one of the Christmas stamps in 1980. Um, as you can see, um, and it went around the world, which was really very exciting for us as the cathedral. As we look at this window in a little bit more detail, this window seems to have all the necessary elements for a nativity scene. It has a wooden stable, it has turtle doves up in the, up in the rafters. Um, there's Joseph, he has his halo, he's holding a lantern, uh, which illuminates the interior of the, of the stable, 
but is also a symbol of Christ as the light who is coming into the world. And Mary, seated, holding the Christ child on her lap. But, Christ, but the fact that the Christ child looks slightly older than a, than a newborn baby gives the tale of this window away. This window celebrates the arrival of the wise men. Their appearance was deemed important enough in the early church to begin a whole new season, that of Epiphany, which begins on January 6th, marks the end of the Christmas season. As of today, the 29th of December, the wise men are coming, but they have not yet arrived. Now, a very different interpretation in the nativity story is seen in the North Porch Tympanum. The North Porch is an entrance to the cathedral. As you enter the porch and walk up the steps towards the entrance, this carving is seen directly over the door. Here, the figure of Mary sits on an elaborate throne. With a carved canopy above her, she is set apart from the figures around her. She is clearly seated like a queen. On the right, her foot does not touch the ground, but rather it rests on a tasseled pillow. She is set very much away from our mortal world. On the left are two shepherds with their sheep, and these are another style of shepherd entirely. They're dressed as classical or Greek or Roman shepherds. Uh, one of them wears a very short toga. Um, he holds his staff in his hand. He holds a lamb to his chest and between his bare legs, he is corralling a ram. Um, sheep are notoriously prone to wander and go astray, a common theme in the Bible. And so he is making sure that his Sheep are under control that they can press towards the Christ child, but not get too close. But on the right are the wise men. Now I've just told you that they haven't arrived yet. The Bible's very clear that the shepherds and the wise men are not in Bethlehem at the same time. Um, the, there are only two places in the Bible that tell the Christmas story. Uh, the Gospel of Matthew talks about the wise men and doesn't mention the shepherds at all. The Gospel of Luke mentions, mentions the shepherds, but has says nothing about the wise men. And biblical historians feel very strongly that these two groups of people were not in Bethlehem at the same time. Did the cathedral not know that? Well, of course it did. The cathedral clergy and staff who commissioned this work from the sculptures from the sculptors of the of the early studios and carver Italo Fanfani in 1942 would absolutely know that. So why are the wise men here? Well, that's because this sculpture has a slightly different story to tell about the birth of Christ. The shepherds are Jews, the chosen people of God. They are poor, humble, and uneducated, but they were the first to hear the good news of Christ's birth. The wise men are Gentiles. They are rich and educated. And so this sculpture tells us that Christ was born for all people, for all time, whoever they are. We've noted that Joseph has been absent in the last couple of depictions of the nativity. The reason he might not be in this carving may have to do with the fact that it is placed in what is known as the women's porch. Almost every cent of the money used to construct this porch was donated by women. And the other sculptures in and around this porch are all of women who served God throughout the ages. So it makes sense that our focus here is on Mary. Now again, it's so hard to explain the scale of this enormous building. You are looking from of a sh on the left of a shot that is looking straight up from the floor of the upper nave level, and you are looking up into the vaulted ceiling. You are looking at these circular stones, which are called boss stones, and the boss stone we're going to talk about is this one. And over here on the right, this is a shot directly uh, straight up at that boss stone. Boss stones are carved projecting stones at the intersection of the vaulting ribs and they lock the vaults together. Their great weight keeps the vault stable 
and in compression. And the ball stones in the nave sit about 100 feet above the main floor. They depict images from the Nicene and Apostles' creeds, the basic statements of faith in the Christian church. Now, this is what the boss stone looks like close up. Uh, this boss stone depicts the line and was born of the Virgin Mary from the creeds. Because it so, sits so high in that vault, sculptor Theodore Barbarossa has sketched in the nativity in, in clear, bold strokes. They surround, he surrounds these figures with a rocky border to depict the cave in which Christ was likely born. A wooden stable, familiar to us in the West, would have been very unlikely in the Holy Land, where wood was scarce and valuable and would not have been used to build a structure to house animals. The tightly swaddled Christ child lies on sculpted hay, and Mary and Joseph's body curve their bodies towards him protectively. His hands appear to reach towards their faces, but this posture also suggests the position of a body that has been crucified. And this is a common position of the child in many nativity scenes, a reminder that his birth begins a journey towards sacrifice and redemption. The photograph on the right uh, was taken after the earthquake here in Washington DC in 2011. And when we put up scaffold in order to uh, do repair work within the building, it gave us access to these nave high nave level bosses that we had not had since these bosses were put in place. And this shot shows you how deeply carved this boss stone is and gives you the details of Joseph and Mary's hands and the expressions of their faces. Until this shot had been taken, uh, no one had been near this boss since, until, since it had been put in the cathedral initially. And it is a truly uh, awesome shot uh, to be able to share with you because none of us have ever been able to be up there to see this detail quite so clearly. The idea of Christ, uh, the Christ child in what is called a cruciform form with its arms out outstretched as if it were, as if he were uh, already hanging on the cross is even more overtly seen in the depiction of the child in the St. Mary's Chapel Reredos. Uh, these wooden Reredos are painted in many colors and gilded with gold leaf. They were designed by the firm of Irving and Casson and were carved by Pellegrini in 1933. Now, in the, even in St. Mary's Chapel, there is no depiction of the nativity scene. But at the very top, Mary pre presents her infant son to the world. His arms are open to embrace the world, but it echoes the form of his crucified body seen directly below. Another depiction that, is, that links the idea of Christ's birth and death together and, the, uh, and focuses us on the idea of Christ being born on earth to save us, is found in the center lancet of the War and Peace window in the Woodrow Wilson Bay. This window was created and fabricated or assembled by artist Erwin Boschani in 1961. Uh, the lancet on the left talks about the golden glow of peace. The lancet on the right talks about the horrors of war, especially as visited upon women and children. At the top of the center lancet, Mary lifts the radiant Christ child. She looks up at him adoringly. Below on the right, there is another woman who looks up at this child, this glowing child adoringly. Mary has actually boosted the Christ child up almost to her shoulder. And you can see that he has a stylized halo and bands of radiance that come out from his from his his beautiful face and his glowing body. But these figures are linked to the images of the crucifixion in a really moving way. If you look at, the, at Mary, this is her shoulder, this is her arm, and this is her torso. This is her knee, and this is also her knee. But if you look closely, her knee, the right-hand knee becomes the shoulder of the older Virgin Mary and she cradles her crucified son in her arms and kisses him. And so this 
is a place where these two images of birth and of sacrificial death come together and are actually melded within the image itself. On the clear stereo windows, the highest level of windows, just about above the war and peace window that you just saw, is a window that puts the birth of Jesus in yet another context. It's called the lineage of Jesus window, and it shows Christ's birth as the culmination of the promises made to Israel and depicts him as Messiah. This window was designed by Rowan Lecomte, assisted by Richard Avedon, and was placed in the cathedral in 1990, 1988, excuse me. In the right lancet is the figure of Abraham. He's in an amazing uh, Harlequin patterned cloak with his long, long beard, and his arms are raised towards a starry sky that echoes God's promise to him that his descendants should be as many as the stars in the sky. The next lancet shows King David as king of Israel. He is the first king of Israel. He holds an orb and scepter, which says he has earthly power and dominion. He wears an elaborate tall golden crown, and beneath him is the city of Bethlehem, his home city. The third lancet shows the Israelites in the time of captivity, held in chains by their captor who raises a green sword above their heads. Uh, they are manacled and they are shackled and they are beaten down. And at the very bottom, you can see that the king's golden crown has fallen. On the far left lancet of this window is a depiction of the nativity of Jesus. Mary sits on a wooden bench and the child sits on her lap. She cradles her, his head in her hands. Um, she holds his knees. She cradles his head in, in her hands. He looks up at her. Um, he has tiny bare feet and he has little hands that appear to be moving. He looks up at her adoringly. Uh, the child wears what's called a tri-radiant halo. And that halo can only be depicted on elements of the Trinity, the figure of Christ, the personification of God or a symbol of the Holy Spirit, it clearly marks him as, as the Messiah. Joseph stands behind Mary uh, with his hand on Mary's shoulder. They feel very, very much like a family. Um, you might notice that Mary is wearing a necklace uh, that looks like a string of pearls, as a matter of fact. Um, Joseph has a sweeping robe he has an amazing blue hat, which almost covers his halo, but not quite. And in his hand, he holds a, a short staff. Joseph is often depicted as holding a wooden staff, which has miraculously burst into life with fruit or flowers. This is a symbol of the new life that is given to us in Christ. Here, his staff is a branch of holly. In the Middle Ages, many legends grew up around the holly tree. And one of the best known equates the prickly leaves of the holly to the crown of thorns placed on Jesus's head before crucifixion with the red berries associated with the drops of blood he shed for our salvation. Above the Holy Family, the star of Bethlehem shines brightly to tell the world that the Messiah has come. Now, these are the major images of the nativity here at Washington National Cathedral, but there are many smaller Im images that tell the story of the birth of Christ. And some of these are on the handmade needlepoint kneelers or kneeling cushions used in Bethlehem Chapel. Uh, this one, we're back to the shepherds again. They are out, they have their sheep, they are watching their flocks, they are seeing the star. Notice that they are oriented the way we are. So we are actually seeing what they are seeing. And that puts us into the image and helps us to try and experience it in the ways that the shepherds themselves have done. This image comes from the first lines of Christmas carols. This one is away in a manger. You see the manger in the center, uh, surrounded by tiny sheep and the ox and ass are back again. Uh, they are here again to witness and watch over 
uh, the, the Christ child. One of the great medieval legends is that the ox and ass also leaned towards the child on the cold night and that their breaths warmed him as he slept. Another image from Bethlehem Chapel, Mary, who is kneeling at the foot of the manger uh, with, the, with the tiny child and his radiant halo and these wisps of hay and straw, which are escaping from the manger itself. This is one of the most unusual depictions of, of Christmas that you will see in this cathedral and perhaps in many others. This is Mary and Joseph. They have arrived in the stable and this is Joseph helping Mary to lie down before she gives birth to the Christ child. He's very tenderly laying her down onto the ground. Uh, they are surrounded by very interesting geometric trees. Uh, the the donkey, which she has traditionally ridden to Bethlehem, is there watching, complete with a saddle blanket. And the Star of Bethlehem is depicted as a cross. So again, we are back to that idea of the birth that through death saves us. So, Merry Christmas, joy to the world, the Lord is come. The Star of Bethlehem still shines. Often in places you don't expect it. Here it's a beloved, it's seen above the philosopher's window, reminding us to continue to search beyond our own minds to find the gift of Christ. The wise men are journeying on to Bethlehem. Here they are, carved in the armrest of a pew in the great choir. They are resting in an oasis on their long journey. They haven't found the child yet but they are pressing on in their journey. They haven't arrived yet, but they are coming. So thank you so much for coming and sharing this Christmas journey with us. We wish you every blessing as you continue in this Christmas season and wish you, your friends and family a happy and healthy new year. If anyone has any questions, I'd be happy to try and answer them. Thank you again for coming. I, I think this may be a first. We don't have any questions in the Q&A right now. Oh, mercy. I will talk more then. <laughs> <laughs> Lori, this was fabulous. Thank you so much for sharing your knowledge with us and uh, some of these needlepoint cushions I've never seen in Saint Mary in, a, in Bethlehem Chapel. So thank you. Yes, well, we rotate them through, of course, so that they wear evenly. And so sometimes we do have a chance to show you some treasures that you might not be able to see if you were here even visiting us in person in the cathedral. Okay, we do now have a question. Uh, what okay. is your favorite nativity depiction within the cathedral? Oh, that, that is always a really difficult uh, one. I will say that I do love the lineage of Jesus window, the last window that I showed you. There is something that feels to me very tender and very um, and very familial about that window um, that I find very accessible and and very um, and very loving. And so uh, I love I love all of them. As I say, they all teach us uh, something differently. They show us a different perspective on on what the Christmas story can be. Uh, but that I must confess is probably one of my favorites. And. Uh, I, I'm going to answer a question. Uh, Peggy Luckman asks that she's taken some pictures. Can she share them on Facebook if they are designated that they're from the cathedral? And, and yes, of course, uh, of course you can do that. And we have another question from Ron. In the needle point cushions, who decided the composition of the cushions? Oh, that's that's an interesting story about all of the artwork here at the cathedral. Um, everything goes through a review process here, but professional designers design our needlepoint cushions. And so as a result, uh, we often will ask for a depiction that would be appropriate for Christmas. And so um, somebody submitted a design, it went through a review process here at the cathedral, was accepted, and then that needlepoint cushion was designed and then sent out to be 
hand stitched by people across the nation and the world. And then when those kneelers were finished, they were returned to the cathedral where they were blocked and stuffed and then put into the cathedral where they could be used. And so uh, in Bethlehem Chapel, there are many different um, eras, I suppose we would say, of needlepoint from the very from very simple geometric designs to single designs, the things that were like uh, the king's crowns or doves, and then they became more and more complex in design as the years went by. And they really have culminated in the first lines of Christmas carols, and they are really amongst the most complex and beautiful of the kneelers here at the cathedral. Great. Uh, we have a question about boss stones and how that's yes. spelled and what does the word mean? Oh, I'm sorry. This might be my New Jersey accent. B-O-S-S -S stones. And they are really the major stones. Um, if you were thinking about building just an arch, you might think of them as a keystone, but the boss stone really um, is, it's the major stone in the arch and it keeps the arch stable. I won't go more into architecture because that is not my my strong suit, um, but um, we can certainly refer you to how Gothic arches and vaults are built. Uh, we have a question about how many angels are in the artwork of the cathedral. <laughs> oh, mercy. Uh, that I would not even want to, to have a guess, but we have a wonderful docent who gives a, an angel tour. Um, if indeed we get a chance to have her come online and give that tour, you would certainly be able uh, to ask Joan Ruska, who is one of our splendid docents and our angel expert. I'm not even necessarily sure that Joan knows how many angels, because there are many both inside and outside the cathedral. Uh, and then uh, Chris Budney asks about the crash exhibit and whether the cathedral continues to add to the collection. Uh, yes, just to give, for those of you who are not familiar with the crush exhibit, uh, this year would have been our 30th year of doing uh, an exhibit of crushes from around the world. Um, we have done it for many, many years. Um, it is an amazing uh, depiction that takes you across cultures and materials and allows you to really experience the cathedral and the story of, of Christ's birth in a new way. Uh, yes. The answer to that is always a qualified yes. Um, our storage space for such a large cathedral is somewhat limited. Um, we do accept um, the potential creches. We ask people to contact us and then we'll take you through a process. At this point, we really need to be looking at, at either countries that we don't have, materials that we don't have, or something that is so exceptional that we really feel that it, it, it needs to add to our collection. Um, as the curator of this collection all these years, I would say I would take everything if I could, but there simply is not nearly enough place to store it all. Let's see, we've had, um, a, what was the different view of the Boston and different sculpture that you showed? Were, where were other sculptures located? Okay, the, the closer view of the boss stones were was taken by a gentleman whose name is Colin Winterbottom, one of the one of a very fine photographer uh, that documented our repairs of the cathedral after the earthquake here in Washington in 2011. Um, and he was able to actually be standing on a on a scaffold directly below or directly behind this boss. Uh, this is the scaffold. We called it the the dance floor at the time and he is standing on that skull on that uh, scaffold and he is shooting um, sort of horizontally at at this so this is what you would look at if you were standing below it and here is what you would look here's what you could see if you were standing at that same level about a hundred feet above your head if you were standing on the cathedral floor and the and other boss stones are directly in front of this like back in here and behind where colin is standing and so this is why this is a very unique view of this boss does that answer the question <laughs> I, I, it's hard to tell if it answered the question. Ah, uh, yes, as I say, if, if anyone needs clarification, please please go back on and onto the chat and ask. Um, we've had a question. I'm not quite sure this. It says, "How was the how is the music disseminated?" I'm not quite sure what that's referring to. 
<laughs> oh yeah, I don't know if if that's referring to service music or to or to concerts here at the cathedral, and that falls well without my well outside of my expertise. Um, certainly, I know that the services that we have been broadcasting are available on on many types of media, and I would have to refer that back to to Mimi, who is who is our creative director on that. Uh, luckily, I'm not responsible in any way. Yes, as I say, I, I may, I may be sending, I may be sending this back to Mimi, who, who, uh, who is not necessarily the person uh, who needs, who knows how that all happened. We, we have a, a, a very talented staff in our music department, yeah. and I believe their email is musicdepartment@cathedral.org, and they could answer more questions about about the music and how music is selected and all of that at the cathedral then uh, it's, it's certainly well beyond my breadth of experience. Uh, George Hodgson asks, wasn't there a fire? Um, there was a fire many, many, many years ago that did very, very little damage, thankfully, at the cathedral. Um, our worst disaster here at the cathedral was the earthquake in 2011. It by far did more damage than anything else that has ever happened here at the cathedral. Um, but the fire um, happened, um, I'm going to say in the early 1960s, it did, uh, it was caught very quickly and there was very, very little damage to it. Um, it certainly was frightening, but did not really impact the continuing construction of the cathedral that was going on at that time. Of course, the most uh, traumatic uh, Cathedral Fire recently was Notre Dame in Paris. Yes, yes. Um, we have a question about whether there are any depictions of Jesus's baptism within the cathedral. Oh yes, there are many, and and that unfortunately moves us into the into the season of Epiphany. So I did not touch on that, uh, but there it certainly is one actually in the. Uh, the uh, Angels of the Nativity window on the left-hand side of that. Let me see if I can pull that up for you. And then uh, there is there are there's a large one in uh, up on the on the on the south on the north side up in the nave. Uh, yes, this this lancet here is the baptism of Jesus. This is Jesus here. This is John the Baptist here. And this is the water that flows around them. I'm sorry, I did not, I did not blow that one up because it's, it's, it falls a little bit beyond the, the scope of the, of the Christmas story I was telling, but maybe someone will look into this as we move into further into the church year. But yes, there are many depictions of, of the baptism of Jesus. And there were a couple, uh, couple suggestions of, of creating a talk like this about the other liturgical seasons throughout the year. And as we develop these talks uh, for the coming year, we'll certainly look at that and, 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 and determine whether or not we have uh, staff who can do that and whether we have images that would support that. So as we develop program, future programming, we will take that into consideration. Um, and then the final question is where, where is this year's clay-like crash from? And I'm not sure. Uh, I, I think if, if you have, we're watching uh, any of our Christmas services. I think you're talking about what we call the cathedral crash. Um, it was behind the clergy and in, in many of the shots and it is also, it was also, there were um, close in uh, uh, Zoom shots of it uh, during the Christmas, uh, uh, both I believe the lessons and carol service and Christmas Eve. Um, this was made by an alumna of the National Cathedral School, the girls' school uh, that is associated uh, with uh, the cathedral. Um, it is one of the cathedral's treasures. Of course, I don't have a slide of it here for you, and I'm and I'm so sorry. Um, but it is it is a, a beautiful and very uh, human and moving depiction of the nativity. Um, and so we we hope to be able to share that with you when you can return and come into the building as well next Christmas. Um, it is well worth seeing. And as I say, if you'd like to see more of it, if you would like to go to the cathedral website and either go through the cathedral service of Christmas lessons and carols or the Christmas Eve services, I believe there are images in as part of both of those, those broadcasts. Uh, yes, and I think it may also no, it was not in our family service as well. Uh, it's quite large, uh, yeah. which I don't think you necessarily get to see on on screen because again, everything looks smaller within the cathedral because the space is so large. It's it's a wonderful depiction and it includes some real people or 
figures that look a lot like some real people, including our for former Alter Guild leader and uh, Archbishop Desmond Tutu, one of the figures remarkably resembles. Um, all of our cathedral Christmas services from 2020 are available at our YouTube channel, which is youtube.com slash WN Cathedral. Uh, and you can ser search through those as well as our regular Sunday services. Um, again, Lori, thank you so much. This was such a great talk and uh, I certainly learned a lot. So I know that other people probably did as well. Well, thank you for having me. I thoroughly enjoyed it. And as I say, please come back and, and visit us again. Uh, we'll have more spotlight tours coming up and our docents are wonderful. So please do come back and enjoy another tour with us.